topic of much discussion and debate is distribution, from cultivators to brands to retail. Cannabis distribution in California has become a key issue for investors to understand. Should companies work with a third party distributor or self-distribute? What kind of issues should companies consider when vetting potential partners? These are tough questions, but fortunately we have put together an all-star panel of experts and operators to answer the complexities of the distribution market here in California. Um, and we'll look at how it impacts all stakeholders in the supply chain. Our panelists for this session are Christy Noblick, co-founder and COO of Kiva Convections, Felipe Recaldes, co-founder of Rise Brands, and Sturgis Carbon, CEO of MJ MJIC. The panel will be moderated by Brian Shang. Brian is a, one of Arcview's, is a GP of Arcview's venture fund. Brian was a co-founder of Fresh VC, a leading early stage venture capital fund and focused on investments in water, marketplaces, and frontier technologies. At Fresh, Brian led the investments in several multi-hundred billion dollar companies, including FND, Fiscal Note, Ease, and served on the board of directors of Ease and FND. So I'd now like to welcome our panelists to the stage. Please give a warm round of applause. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Mike. Um, so the distribution market is um, one of the most important um, market to understand for investors, and it's great to have our great panelists here today, uh, Christy, Felipe, and Sturgis. And so um, I just wanted to start off introducing, you know, making some parallel and some, some analogies here. Um, if you think about, um, you know, making parallels that are alcohol market, some of the largest distribution companies today um, were started kind of in the pre-prohibition era. And um, California being almost half of the legal market today, um, and the regulatory framework around distribution makes it an extremely enticing investment opportunity. Um, and, but the distribution market since January 1st, 2018 has kind of played out to be much more complicated than uh, maybe, or depending on who you ask, much more or less complicated than um, expected. So uh, maybe we can just start off uh, with a quick introduction from the panelists and a little bit about your company and, um, and let's just start off right there. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Christy Noblick Palmer and I'm the co-founder and COO at Kiva Confections. Um, you probably would most likely know us from our chocolate edible confections that we create. Um, the other half of our business is distribution. Um, and we started doing distribution in uh, the end of 2010, really as a way to get our products um, from the home kitchen to the retailer. Um, there wasn't a uh, distributor that you could just pick up and um, call at that time. So the only way to do it was to put those products in your car and drive on down to, um, to Harborside, for example. So um, now we're all throughout the state, from San Diego to Arcata, and uh, we have 11 brands um, in our portfolio. Great, thanks. Hello, my name is Felipe Ricalde, and I'm the co-founder of Rise Brands, a uh, distribution technology and, and full license distributor. Um, we start off, uh, our model is slightly different than Kiva's. Uh, we have, we start off almost with an a la carte model. Uh, we believe that a lot of brands will represent themselves and tell their story better than ourselves. Uh, so they come in and we do the fulfillment, um, the packaging, uh, the labeling, and then we'll do the, we'll give them a platform for them to uh, basically dispatch our vehicles to the endpoints. Um, then we also offer sales as a service. We currently touch about 700 dispensaries. Um, in, we, we are in two states at this point. So we uh, just recently acquired a distributor in Oregon. So we're doing about uh, 300 dispensaries in California and, and 350 in Oregon. So uh, that's it. I have Sturgis Carbon. I'm the CEO of MJIC. We are uh, also focused on California in the distribution layer. Uh, we're, our approach has uh, primarily up to this point been about building the infrastructure out. Uh, so licensed facilities throughout the state in multiple locations. Uh, right now we have um, several uh, across the state, one in uh, Coachella, one in Oakland, one in Long Beach. And we're picking up additional facilities um, kind of to underpin a suite of very similar services in a lot of ways. Um, you know, ultimately to help drive revenue and, and unlock efficiencies for uh, a wide variety of uh, enterprise clients across the entire supply chain. Great. So um, for, for, the, for the audience, um, one of the questions, the first question we'll go over is, you know, um, looking at the distribution market, 
there are hundreds of different uh, small uh, distributors and with different licenses. Um, and, but especially to Felipe and Sturgis, um, we're seeing a lot of cons consolidation much faster than we were expecting. Um, and both of your companies are kind of approaching this with an acquisition strategy, Felipe in, uh, in approaching another state, and then Sturgis kind of, you're building an omni-channel uh, platform for, for kind of end-to-end uh, -end, uh, distribution. Um, so can you, can you talk a little bit more about what you're seeing in the market in terms of the other distributors, um, kind of the, again, from an investor perspective, um, why is this an exciting opportunity, and um, um, what are your plans? Sure. Uh, so I, I guess it, we are seeing a lot of consolidation happening right now, mostly in a lot of the flower brands or manufacturing brands that, that were undercapitalized. So they're coming together and partnering up to get bigger um, or to raise capital together. Uh, it's an exciting time because distribution is mandatory. The barrier of entry, the actual cost, what a lot of uh, smaller brands don't realize is with 280E and how it treats distribution, uh, even you know, with, with a small OPEX of like $500,000 a year to get your license, your insurance, your bonds, uh, you're looking at out the door with a 0% gross receipts tax rate, you're, you have to come out the door and distribute $7 million of product with a 12% margin. So when you go to a lot of these jurisdictions that have, for example, even one or 3% uh, gross receipts tax rate, we're, we're talking you go for, for 1%, you go up to $8 million to a break even, um, and if you get to the 3%, you're looking at $16 million. So for a small brand to come out and begin distributing across the state uh, and to do it on a half a million dollar OPEX, it, it's, it's pretty, you know, it's not realistic. So we're gonna see uh, a lot distribution be really helpful in getting these brands out there. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And I, I would add, I think, um, you know, from a, from a broader perspective, you take that up a little higher. I mean, really what we're talking about is, you know, the fragmentation that's baked into this landscape across the board. So you have, you know, the regula regulatory fragmentation throughout the state, you know, across all of the municipalities that comprise it, and then, of course, on a, mac on a macrocosmic level across the country. And so, you know, the efficiencies in the supply chain are locked in there because, you know, at some point, um, you have to reach a certain level of critical mass to achieve those economies of scale. And I think, ultimately, it's, it's going to be the consolidation because you're right, operators and enterprises are facing that kind of very tall barrier now around making an economic model and you know it that's that's the reason we're a proponent of like the third party model is you can aggregate that achieve that economy of scale and then unlock it for the client as opposed to having to go search for it as an operator directly and that's a systemic thing that's industry wide and then when you throw on top of that kind of you know the incremental activity we're starting to see in the capital markets a lot of money being raised particularly up in Canada you know where is that money going to start going it's going to go into driving that consolidation, um, you know, throughout the industry. So there's a lot of forces at work here, not just in terms of the way the industry operates, but some of the outside forces, like where capital is being derived in, from and in what scale, that I think kind of adds to all of that as well. Looking at the other perspective, Christy, um, obviously half of Kiva's business is distribution, but obviously Kiva Confections has chosen to build out the infrastructure for self-distribution. And a lot, of, a lot of the other large brands have also chosen to really build out the infrastructure. So um, what, what is your viewpoint on kind of, you know, to Disturge's point about third party distribution and how, uh, as the market develops, you know, how does third party distribution fit compared to kind of the larger brands choosing to self uh, distribute? Sure. So um, I think one of the important components of doing self distribution, at least um, for us, has been we had that we had that structure built out already. Um, why would a new brand choose a self-distribution model over a third party? Um, I really think it comes down to the goals of the brand. So um, you can jump right into bed with a third party distributor um, if you wish. Some of the challenges there are proof of concept, right? You've got a brand new brand, pot potentially you don't have any traction or sales history in the state of California. Maybe you have that traction outside of the state, uh, but you're really asking a distribution company to take quite a, um, a gamble on your brand. Um, from the distributor's perspective, if you don't have traction, um, they're looking at that risk, right? Um, it's going to take quite a bit of marketing dollars. Um, I think that's one thing that brands aren't necessarily always aware of when they join a distribution channel. 
Um, just because you're with a distributor, that's not a magic wand. Um, marketing dollars is still a huge part of that. Um, we like to say at our company, it's up to, up to the distributor to, um, to distribute the product, but it's up to the brand to pull those products back off the shelves, right, and generate end consumer demand. Um, so I think that it just depends on what the brand's goals are, um, what their previous um, history has been, and really, if you're a new brand, what do you want to do? Do you want to do you want to make flour or make chocolate edibles or do distribution? Because um, distribution and manufacturing are two completely different sets of headaches. So d just depends on what you focus. You want your focus to be: are you a manufacturer or are you a distributor? But as we, as we kind of look beyond the current state of the market, as um, the larger brands develop, m most of the larger brands uh, will probably develop their own distribution or have already developed their own distribution infrastructure. So is it the case then that kind of, um, and uh, uh, for Felipe and Sturgis, is it the case then that perhaps uh, third party distribution will start serving or will eventually end up serving the long tail of the market instead of kind of all the big brands choosing to distribute for themselves. Um, what, what does that look like? Or what, what, how are you thinking about the fact that the, the you know, uh, to Christie's point? Um, so <laughs> the, um, we're actually pretty excited about some of, there's a lot of inefficiencies that are coming into distribution right now. Uh, so as soon as really metric kicks in or the traceability system, the integrations in, in our supply chain tech that we've built, we're hoping to get these brands there to market uh, you know, have the frictionless, uh, the, the least, uh, the pathway to market with the least amount of friction. And, and so at that time, we, I think there's going to be a lot of transition into what brands do in terms of self-distribution. Um, you know, they've, they've been doing it traditionally, but not with this amount of regulation. So at this point, um, it, looking at what it's going to cost them to actually do this versus what it may cost us that we've been building the infrastructure to do this on a larger scale it may be worth it for them to work with 3PL. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if there's one thing that we can say safely about this industry, it's not one where one size fits all. And, you know, there, there are, I mean, I, I, I understand the wisdom of the self-distribution model in certain cases, like you say. Um, and I, you know, I think that um, from, you know, a longer term perspective, though, the, the thing that gets into my head about it is, you know, how it's just scalability. Right, and ultimately everybody is um, building an enterprise to grow it, and you know this is a—it's just another thing that you have to deal with. Um, so, but I can certainly—you uh, uh, know—I hear everything you're saying about it. Um, just for the investors and the audience, what are some important metrics that you guys are tracking um, for your—you uh, know—whether it's for um, f figuring out uh, how to improve your uh, delivery infrastructure or whatnot? What are important metrics that you're tracking? Uh, or for investors that they might ask to determine whether if they're looking at a distribution deal, if the company is worth investing in or it's something that, um, you know, what, things like that. Um, I think when you're vetting a distributor, um, asking about store account and reach is um, really important. Um, the, the metrics that are provided around sales data, also very important. Um, when orders are delivered, quantities, all those very basic um, metrics. Um, and I also think when it comes down to efficiencies, the distributor is looking at how much product they're taking in each um, delivery. So if you're investing in a distribution company, you're going to want to see how much product is going out in each order. Um, also, what type of inventory is the distributor holding on hand? Um, this year has been like no other year before. Um, these first six months have been pretty, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty chaotic. Um, so it's going to be a little bit hard to look at sales history for this year, um, just because the market's extremely unpredictable. But um, I would say those are some of the some of the components that you would look for. From our standpoint, for efficiencies, we're looking at uh, the average miles per delivery, how many minutes we service a stop, uh, what the margin of a product is uh, per cubic square inch in our warehouse. Um, we look at uh, basically how many stops each driver is making a day in a certain region, so we take telemetric data and adjust our routes accordingly. And so we're looking at those metrics. In terms of a brand and investors coming to us, uh, really the lead times for certain manufactured products or flour when we reorder, 
So if we can't keep this in stock all the time, that's a very big deal for us. Um, and that, that's some of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess uh, the, I would say all of those, but I would also look, you know, um, advertising dollars and marketing spends, you know, the commitment to that. Um, that's a huge part of this. We, we often talk about unlocking efficiencies through the distribution model, but it also is an opportunity to drive revenue. Um, and so there's, you know, the, the investment side of it from the operational end as well that is also important, I think, to look at. And then, of course, you know, there's always the overhang of compliance and making sure that you're diligencing on the compliance side from every angle. And, you know, from an investor perspective, that's absolutely where you need to start is, you know, making sure that the integrity, the compliance is there throughout the operation, everything that touches it. I think one thing, too, um, that Felipe just said that's um, important is lead times for your manufacturers. So um, we're in a high growth um, stage of the cannabis industry. So creating reasonable forecasts for both the setting the distribution expectation, but then also setting the brand up for success and helping them source packaging, source starting materials, and really execute finished goods. Because there's no worse scenario than getting started with a new brand. You're two months in, people love the product, you place an order that was twice the size out of the blue and they can't fill it. And now you've got to call the customer and explain what's going on. So rock solid forecasts, although I'm not sure <laughs> if I think those words contradict each other, but um, forecasting and then communication with your brand, following up on where you are if you're, if you're selling that and then if they're producing that. Um, that, that kind of communication between the brand and distributor is super, super important. Great. Um, so, to some of the so, what does the competitive landscape look like for distribution companies? Um, how large are they? Um, obviously, no need to disclose any of your own numbers, but um, how big are the large distribution companies on the market right now, and how fragmented is the market? Um, so, in in the distribution association, we have 127 members. Uh, the last poll of, that I pulled up on licensing, I think there was like 145 distributors. Um, after the, the transition of, of July 1st and, and the temporary is expiring, uh, we see all size distributors. Primarily, I would say 80 to 90 percent of them are smaller, 10 employees or less, um, and then the other 10 percent are much larger. And I think um, the distribution license um, numbers could be a bit skewed because the state has required distributors to do testing for quality. So um, in, in our facility, we kind of nickname that the quality assurance license because in order to do your own quality assurance testing, you have to have a, distributor, a distributor's license. So it kind of skews the numbers a little bit um, and makes it seem as though there's far more distributors than are probably actively pursuing distribution as an actual business. Um, and then I think what you also see is regional strengths. So somebody will be really strong in um, Southern California or the Humble area, um, but statewide is still, um, is still a little bit more difficult to pull off. Um, and we're still only seven and a half months into um, when a distribution license is required. So all of this is gonna shake out. It's still very unpredictable right now, but in two years from now, it'll be a completely different looking landscape um, for distributors. Um, but two years from now, that's, you know, everyone's trying to get an opportunity now, right? So two years from now, the market would have developed more and that a lot of, you know, the consolidation, you know, six months ago, a lot of investors might have said the consolidation will happen maybe in two or three years. We're already seeing a lot of uh, people from outside the industry, especially from the alcohol world, kind of recognizing that, okay, this kind of looks similar to what we've seen in the alcohol world, and then kind of understanding the opportunity and putting a lot of capital to work. Um, how fast do you think that will happen? How fast do you think there's an opportunity here for uh, investors to invest, and um, what will that look like? I think it's happening now. I mean, it, I think it's, happen it's happening yesterday, um, ultimately. I mean, the, if, if you look at, you know, how fast this, this industry is evolving in general, you know, it's evolving as a whole, right? And, you know, the, when, it, when something emerges that quickly, it, it kind of reveals exactly where the weaknesses are, and that's what spurs, you know, innovation. We've seen that over and over again in a lot of different emerging industries that aren't as regulated as this. Um, and so I think that, you know, th this is really the window where I think we're starting to see you know, the first generation of some of the category killers, and that's giving some of the, you know, kind of big um, 
outside you know, operators that don't touch the plant, like big alcohol, et cetera, giving them some confidence to step in. I think we're going to see more of that. And I think if you're not planning or positioning for that today, then you haven't learned anything from the last four or five years. And so I think it's, I think it's happening right now. Yeah, totally agree. Um, I think there's still quite a few natural barriers to entry um, with uh, cities coming online and permitting retail. So um, last year we had thousands of dispensaries that we could deliver to. This year we're somewhere close to about 500. Um, so reaching those stores has become far um, easier than it would have been to reach, reach those stores last year. But we still have entire segments of the market that are like a retail desert, right? I mean, LA is a good example. Um, the East Bay is a good example. There's just no retail there still yet. So um, that's, that's one of the big barriers is there's not enough retail at this current moment. Does that play into your decision to expand to another state, Felipe, or? Uh, no, we, we have a lot of brands, so we're going into a third state next, and so as we have infrastructure in all these states, one of the things that they're looking for is a, a consistent experience across these states. So uh, whether they have manufacturing capacity there and distribution, uh, when we offer that, it, that is something a lot of brands are looking for. So California is obviously the largest market. Um, how have you guys thought about um, focusing on California market, you know, obviously given the current limited retail uh, reach um, versus expanding to another state that, uh, or other brands that might have multi-state reach? Um, how, how have you guys thought about that? Uh, well, I mean, I, I guess uh, from a multi-state perspective, it's, it's kind of different for us. We're, we're looking at it, um, I guess, more in line of the comment I made before in terms of positioning now. Um, so I think, you know, a, a lot of the questions that you can ask about this, really the answers depend on your time horizon, whether you're an operator or you're an investor. If your time horizon is long enough on this industry, which I think to some extent it really has to be, and that's hard because there's a lot of really exciting things happening every moment right in front of you. But if you're taking a longer term view, um, and this is kind of like, you know, I said the lessons of the last four or five years, I think if you're not strategically, whether or not there's necessarily an economic you know, imperative to be there right now or an operational imperative to be there right now, we're thinking about it strategically and in going into other states because we know that at some point, you know, what we've seen happen you know, on a microcosmic level in California is eventually gonna happen with the entire country and it's eventually gonna happen around the world. In fact, what are, there's you know, 30 or 40 countries right now in the middle, metaphorically, of repealing their own Volstead Acts. So if your time horizon is long enough, then you know, it's really more about strategic positioning today. And you know, that's, that's kind of the way that we're looking at it. And there's also, it takes a long time to post a flag up in another state. Yeah. So we're, we're getting moving on it now. If it, it could take us a year in, you know, what, even as legislation pushes distribution into uh, their framework. So we're getting ready and, and lobbying. And for Kiva, um, distribution will likely for us only ever happen in California. Um, as you mentioned, it's the largest market, so um, it's a great way for us to protect our, um, like our mothership brand, the Kiva Confections brand. Also, um, find cool, new, innovative brands, bring them to market, do that test case, um, and then take those brands that are in our portfolio and help them get across um, to other markets and other states um, as well as we do the same for our model. But um, at this current point, distribution in California is all we're gonna pursue. So um, one of the important things that um, you know, brands need to do is kind of educate and, and have a sales team and go into dispensaries and kind of telling, um, you know, basically pitching the brand on why it's great. Like you said earlier about taking a gamble on the brand, why should, why should they take a gamble on the brand? So to that end, um, is it a conf well, to Christie's the question is, is it a conflict for you to be holding different brands in your portfolio while kind of distributing for your own brand and for uh, Sturgis and uh, Felipe, you know, how, how do you enable the kind of that process to still be happening very um, uh, thoroughly for different brands that are working with you? Um, how do you manage that process? I guess Christy first. Sure, so um, as much as I would love to think that every person entering a dispensary is buying a Kiva bar, um, I don't think that's happening. So um, I think it's just a great way to find products in the cannabis space that complement the Kiva brand. So um, within our portfolio, we're looking for products that are 
um, of the highest quality, not necessarily the most expensive or the cheapest or brands that are trying to be all things to all people, but we look for quality brands that our buyers are going to be happy to see put out on the desk in front of them. Um, we never want to um, overload our buyer or offend our buyer by just bringing them a whole bunch of crap that we don't think they're probably gonna want anyway. So we really carefully select and vet the brands we put in our book so that we don't take advantage of that kind of VIP pass that we've been given by our buyer. For people who haven't had Kiva chocolate bars, should definitely have them. Uh, for, also, uh, for us, it's also very important to have uh, the right uh, brand portfolio going in, hitting all the different categories that dispensaries need, because otherwise they're going to call another distributor, and so we'd like to be able to service each category. Um, we pay our salespeople, uh, our inside sales team, the same commission for all brands. Uh, so if the brands do have promotions that they are, have for a time period, then they're incentivized to sell that, but otherwise they're selling everybody equally. They want their commission. I would say something similar. I mean, I think our, our view of it is we look at clients more as a partnership. So there's, you know, a, a suite of services um, that run through the infrastructure that's, you know, very operational in nature, but um, philosophically, you know, we're, we're very hands-on. So that, that includes like getting into the marketing and, and into the branding and understanding that because like you say, we're taking a risk on those things. And so it's in our interest to help, um, you know, to help support it. And that's something that we do, you know, equally across the entire portfolio. Um, and, and beyond that, I think, um, you know, you look for ways uh, to find affinity in, in your portfolio between brands um, so that, you know, kind of uh, the tide raises all boats um, and everyone can kind of realize or unlock some kind of synergy. So there's, you know, some thinking about it and some of that comes down to looking at how the market is segmenting and not just, you know, diversifying across, you know, product category, but also across the way the demographics are shifting within that market. So there's you know, a different levels of analysis for us that allows us to manage that and make sure that we're keeping certain things apart in the right way, but also putting them together in ways where they can help each other. So, so how do brands kind of evaluate that process and say this is something that's managed well by the distributor? So you know, I'm gonna make a comparison to alcohol again. You know, when the alcohol distribution company, they kind of go there, everyone knows what they want. They want the products they carry, everyone knows their beers, everyone knows their whatnot. So it's kind of just like picking from the distribution company what they want. But for cannabis, it's kind of different, right? So there are a lot of brands that people don't know yet. Um, even there's a handful of brands uh, that are very well-known names by now. Um, and as new kind of companies and new brands emerge and you start carrying more of those brands, obviously brands will want to make sure that, um, you know, that they're being, that they're being uh, sold right and whatnot. So how, how, how is that process can be, you could talk about being equal, so how is that process equal? Um, so for us, when we look at the uh, setting up the brand portfolio, we're looking also at a lot of the metrics. So we let the consumers tell us what they want. And so when we study, for example, you know, we broke down the territories of, of San Francisco versus Oakland spends uh, by the consumers and, and usually by their category mix. Uh, they're very different. You know, San Francisco is about double that, right? So when we come to a store and say, hey, look, this is, this is what's on your shelves right now. We're seeing this product moving on about six days versus this other one you're carrying at 14. Uh, we think we should mix this up and have a better blend. And so it's all about analytics and insights. Um, and perhaps, um, you know, just to wrap up our conversation, um, maybe um, let our inv investors in the audience know, um, basically on the distribution side, what do you think are the, um, wh what do you think are the opportunities for investors to participate in? Um, how do our investors uh, participate in deals like these? Um, as I'm sure the com your, your companies are raising money on the market, um, how are you approaching your investments from whom, um, and perhaps, you know, even looking at uh, some of the public market stuff, um, how are you approaching that to anyone? Sure. Well, we, we, we are actually going public next quarter um, in Canada. Um, and I guess, you know, if, in, in talking to investors and trying to explain the story, it really is kind of in the way this whole conversation has evolved. It really is about um, that strategic positioning over what's happening. So, um, you know, industry wide. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the fundamental point, and, and this is the reason we did a, a huge analysis when we looked at where in the supply chain to participate and we, we picked this, 
to some extent by process of elimination because it's price agnostic and you're kind of away from a lot of the price compression that you see, particularly as new markets or new states come online. So you have that element of it. Um, but you also have, I think, really, if you add all of this up, a strategic chokehold on the entire industry in a lot of ways. Now that means that there's a lot attendant to that in terms of your responsibility from a compliance perspective, in terms of the robust nature of the services that you need to provide, integrate that with a you know a robu equally robust infrastructure. There's a lot there, but what comes out the other end of that is something that I think you know creates a huge amount of value across the entire industry, um, but also positions you know a very fundamental business model that's going to be you know. It, it is, to some extent, timeless and impervious to a lot of the other machinations in the industry, and we all know how volatile it is. Uh, we're also going public in this next quarter as well, in the Canadian market as well. Um, and so we're going to see a lot of distribution companies going for that. We need a lot of capital. This is a very capital-intensive business, so uh, to be relevant is just necessary. We should go have a beer. Perfect. Perfect. <clears throat> and I'm happy to, um, to say that we just completed our Series A yesterday afternoon, um, so I'm super excited. But I think the largest opportunity in, um, in distribution right now is with brand building. Um, there are so many cool new products coming out and so many new consumers that are coming to the industry and they're looking for trusted brands just like what they're used to when they shop at Starbucks or Target or you name it, right? They're looking for that traditional brand experience. And in the past, it's been very hard to find that with cannabis. And I think distributors are um, in a unique position to, to build brands and that's extremely exciting. And, and for investors, as an opportunity right now, uh, we've seen a lot of brands grow. There, there is brand soup right now, so there isn't a lot of brand royal or loyalty. Um, so well-capitalized brands that come in and, and uh, I guess really slotting isn't prohibited uh, through the regulations right now. So you're seeing shelf space being slotted and, and basically purchased. So that's a, a big opportunity if you're capitalizing one of your brands to get out there. Great, and that's all the time we have. Please give a round of applause to our great panelists. Thank you very much. And, uh